This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. I play to, in front of an audience, you're going to play at an extreme level that you would never do in a practice room because it hurts. You're going beyond pain. If I'm rehearsing or practicing, I'll go till it hurts and then I'll stop. But in front of an audience, you can't. You know, if it starts to hurt, if you get a cramp, or if you cut your finger, or any of those things, you have your, you know, willpower has to take you beyond those things, and discipline demands it. So I play at a much greater level live, and in fact, that's why I rehearse. When I'm rehearsing for a tour, I play to the records because that's me at a superhuman level. That's better than I can really play. So if I work, if I try to rehearse to that level, it drives me to the level that I'll need for a, a live performance. But if you feel the the expectation from an audience that even if you don't feel well, even if something hurts, even if you're not having a great night, you know, you have to, you have to push it out. It's just like a, a responsibility, I think, that you just feel night after night. Why, hello, you lucky people out there. I am your teacher and host, Mr. Walsh. Uh, what we're going to do today is pretty much a hot take. I'm going to talk at you guys for about 20 minutes or so, talking about the Old West, uh, when it was the New West, and a place of opportunity for many, many uh, people in the United States, several men, a lot of a lot of dude talk today. Uh, but all that being said, I'm going to try to get this done in one sitting, uh, both for uh, just kind of an activity to make things a little bit more interesting, but also to cut back on editing time. So I'm going to be looking at the pictures. Those pictures will hopefully pop up where they need to pop up in the program. Um, I'll do all that, but uh, I want to try to get as much of a classroom feel for this as possible. I know it's it's really odd and all that. So I guess it wouldn't be bad to do some notes on this. Uh, you can. I've got those notes also posted on Google Classroom, and I'll put some graphics up when I get back to editing this whole thing in and, and whatnot. So let's go ahead and get started. Louisiana Purchase, of course, 1803, Lewis and Clark. Uh, sail up the Missouri River. They go over the Continental Divide. What they had to do for Thomas Jefferson was to find a way to the Pacific Ocean. And so they follow the Columbia River uh, down through the border of Washington State and Oregon, and they eventually get to the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean? To the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so the Columbia River, uh, it was an area that had already been mapped. We talked a little bit about this. I know it's been a while in Unit 4, but it had already been mapped by the United States there in 1792. Uh, in fact, the whole area that we call the Pacific Northwest today was really blowing up as far as European and American exploration, uh, settlement, uh, a lot of forts being built, you know, not only by the United States and Great Britain, but also Russia. In fact, Russia uh, is going to build forts in Alaska and Hawaii and even as far south as California. They're going to be building uh, structures. So why is everybody there? Well, uh, a big part of that is the fur trade. Um, beaver fur and other animals were a source of income for the people that were hardy and brave enough and maybe, uh, you know, just desperate enough to go into the West and, and find these furs, trap these animals and bring their furs back. Uh, sort of a way that, uh, you know, the whole idea is to cut out the middleman. We, we've seen how the Native Americans had been used by the French uh, to go out into the forests and find furs back in, you know, the 16 and 1700s here in Illinois. Well, um, by the time we get into the 1820s, uh, there are a lot of people that are from the United States, a lot of uh, white explorers, mountain men uh, that are going to go out and, and try to do the same thing, and they're going to be fairly successful at it. Uh, John Jacob Astor had set up a fur trading empire, not only in the Pacific Northwest, but even the East Coast. Uh, it's kind of an interesting story as far as, uh, you know, rich white guys are concerned. John Jacob Astor uh, would be worth over $100 billion today. And if you hear that name a lot in history, well, there was his great-grandson who had died on the Titanic when it sunk after hitting an iceberg there in 1912. He was actually the richest man in the world at that time, according to some people. Well, uh, speaking of other people that are going to be trying to get rich, uh, John Jacob Astor had established a post, a fur trading post, on the Columbia River there in Astoria, Oregon where the Goonies were filmed, a movie from my youth. Hey, Walsh, want to go for a little ride? Sucker! There's uh, two guys that really come to mind when we talk about these mountain men. Um, the first one is a guy by the name of Jedediah Smith, and he's going to play a central role in today's story. And we also have uh, another guy by the name of Jim Bridger, 
who we'll hear about, you know, in the rest of this unit because he plays a pretty central part in this whole westward expansion thing. Well, um, a mountain man is somebody that can go out and live amongst the Native Americans to adopt their ways, their languages. In fact, uh, you're going to have a lot of these mountain men being able to provide other white settlers, other people from the United States who are pushing into the West, uh, kind of reconnaissance. They'll serve as guides. In the truest sense of the word, these guys are trailblazers. Um, as far as our friend here, uh, Jedediah Smith, he was born in 1799. Now, I you guys remember, I don't think dates should be, you know, super important. Um, we wouldn't be test over that, but you think about, okay, well, this puts him, you know, in his, his physical prime, uh, right there in 1822, when he leaves his family uh, after moving, you know, from New York to Ohio, following in the footsteps of, you know, several other hundreds of thousands of people, um, Jedediah breaks out on his own and heads to St. Louis, and he gets caught up basically in a uh, fur trading expedition. These guys are heading out uh, up the Missouri River, following in the footsteps of Lewis and Clark. Well, uh, there's a lot of different things that happen on this trip. It's fairly well documented. Uh, unfortunately, Jedediah didn't get a lot of his papers and letters, maps published or any of that, so he wasn't really actually well known uh, until the 20th century. But Jedediah is uh, not your stereotypical, you know, kind of hillbilly mountain man unable to, to, to read or write. I mean, Jedediah could speak a little bit of Latin in his that he had learned in his schooling. He um, was literate. He he kept pretty detailed records. Some of the stuff that we know about his life comes to us from from letters, um, and then of course some some of the stuff. A lot of the stuff we hear from his life comes from the fact that he was uh, just this really strong person, uh, smart person with a almost superhuman, well, it had to be superhuman, uh, to high tolerance for pain. I mean, there's this, you know, living out on the frontier is rough, rough work. You don't get a nice soft bed and certainly not the type of food that you or I eat. So Jedediah and some of his fellow trappers are out in this uh, river and they're setting uh, beaver traps. You'd have to set these big metal traps down uh, into the river where the beavers would be. And uh, it's dangerous, cold, nasty work because you could be attacked by Indians, natives, or you could be attacked by wild animals. And in this case, uh, Jedediah and his compatriots are going to be attacked by a bear. Uh, Jedediah was attacked so quickly, the bear you know, lunged at him that he wasn't able to reach for a, a knife or a pistol. Uh, the bear will just, you know, maul into him. Uh, he'll crush his ribs. He'll tear him uh, from almost to pieces. I mean, there's blood everywhere. He has a cut across the side of his face from a from a bear claw. A bear claw. Um, he gets, you know, like I said, ribs broken, but he's also cut and lacerated uh, in a lot of places. Uh, but the one thing that's absolutely horrific, uh, how he even survived uh, this attack was that his ear was hanging off the side of his head. Uh, he'll lose his ear in all of this. In fact, the only way that uh, Jedediah is going to be saved is by being sewn up uh, with you know, a needle, and maybe it's a bone needle or a metal needle, but he's going to be sewn up by one of his fellow trappers so he doesn't bleed to death on the cut that he has from this, this bear. I don't know if they ever got the bear, but that's a special kind of tough right there, guys. Um, Jedediah is going to survive. In fact, after taking about a week and a half off, he's, you know, right back out there on the trail setting these traps. And uh, Jedediah is going to earn a reputation of being sort of the strong and silent type. Um, after these expeditions are done, Jedediah, uh, along with another one of his trapper, another one of his friends by the name of Jim Bridger, uh, who was a little bit younger than Jedediah, but not by much, like five, six years, uh, they're going to explore most of the American West. When we think about the West today, uh, we are thinking about uh, a lot of different... Um, really? Really? No. And there's a lot of stories about Jedediah and, and Jim Bridger's narrow escapes from the Native Americans. In fact, uh, in one situation, these guys that were called the uh, Arikra, uh, these Native Americans out there, are going to be basically chasing 
uh, Jedediah and Jim Bridger. And what's going to end up happening is they're going to actually rediscover uh, this place in Wyoming called the South Pass. Uh, it had first been seen by some guys who had worked for J- uh, J- on Jacob Astor uh, there in the early 1800s, but, but nobody really knew about that. In fact, that group was actually trying to run away from uh, the natives as well. But the South Pass is this kind of place that it doesn't really look like a valley to us being from, you know, Illinois. But it's sort of a high plain that's relatively flat, or at least has rolling hills uh, that you can get through the Rocky Mountains. And so today, uh, looking at the South Pass and the areas around it, and there's some other passes too, but uh, this is where you're going to find interstates and railroads and and basically how people get in and out uh, of that area. So the South Pass is going to end up forming a really big part uh, of what becomes known as the Oregon Trail, which we'll talk about here in another episode. (laughs) episode, lesson, whatever you want to call it. Jedediah Smith and Jim Bridger are going to go and explore most of the American West. Uh, They're the first white Americans to see places like Yellowstone National Park, uh, the Grand Canyon, the Mojave Desert, uh, the Grand Tetons. I mean, all these places that we really don't, uh, all these places that, you know, we we think of kind of are iconic Uh, in our understanding of what the West looks like. Talking about going West, there's just so much natural beauty out there. It's hard to believe that we live in a country that has as much diverse geography uh, as the United States. Um, I've been out to Yellowstone. I've, I've haven't been to the Grand Canyon. I haven't been to actually a lot of places. In fact, I've mostly been in like Wyoming and Montana. Um, I feel like I've only seen maybe like one fourth of the West. Uh, there's a lot out there that still needs to be seen by my own eyes. Um, but the fact that these guys traveled around the area without cars amongst us, you know, basically, you know, vicious and, and, and hostile natives, uh, along with, you know, the issue of just trying to rough it, to try to, 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 to survive day to day. Uh, you know, you get hurt, you break a leg, you fall down, you, you bu- break an arm, uh, you know, you get sick, you know, you're so far away from civilization, it's, you're, you're just, you're a dead man. Eventually, Jedediah's luck is going to run out. Uh, down there in Arizona, uh, Jedediah is going to be attacked, uh, allegedly attacked, by some Comanche natives. Uh, and there's a lot of different stories about how this whole episode went down. Uh, there's a lot of good books about uh, Jedediah. He appears, you know, a lot in the Western, uh, early Western historiography. There's a lot, there's some decent books and a few uh, things. In fact, I'll put a link on the classroom here, and you can read a little bit more at your leisure. But apparently he was uh, attacked and killed by the Comanche there in Arizona. Jim Bridger is going to continue to hunt and trap. Uh, He's also then going to start a business. Uh, He's going to guide people through the west, through the the, the South Pass. He's going to guide people uh, basically all the way to California, basically, you know, essentially opening up that that area, that that territory to uh, settlement really quickly. I mean, if you don't have Jim Bridger, you're going to have westward expansion set back a few years. Jim Bridger is going to eventually have uh, three different wives, not all at once, but three different Native American wives uh, who are going to uh, basically all die of health complications and in, in childbirth. In fact, a few of his children are going to be involved in some uh, things that happen here in the story of the West. Bridger's going to retire uh, to a farm in Missouri, and he's going to pass away uh, there in 1881 at like the age of 77. So uh, definitely an American icon and another person to to read about further if you'd like to know more. Uh, So the mountain man, he gets this reputation of being the one with the knowledge, the one that knows where to go, the one who knows uh, whether or not the Native Americans in the next valley over are friend or foe. Uh, that's why, you know, the names of these guys live on. There's going to be several trails that are going to be going west. You guys have already done that uh, geography activity uh, on Unit 5, and I know it's been a while, and it's probably still at school. And why am I talking about geography activities? You should only be talking about the trail and the stuff with the thing. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about one final concept for today. Um, we're going to talk about manifest destiny. 
This will not be the only time you hear about this. This idea of manifest destiny is such a big concept and such a huge part of the history of the United States that you'll hear about it for every single class you take in in history, social studies and all that. So it was a term that was first coined in 1845. I believe it was in a newspaper. The quote reads, The fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by Providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. There's a lot to break down there. Fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent. So the fulfillment to, to make something happen. It's, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to be uh, almost like a promise. It was allotted by Providence. Allotted by providence. So whenever they say providence, they're talking basically about uh, you know the idea that there's a you know higher power at play here. Whether you want to call that God, spirituality, it's the forces of the universe. Uh, you know the Native Americans would call it the Great Spirit. The fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. So. The idea that we're getting bigger and bigger in terms of our population. I mean, the population's growing. It's doubling uh, almost every generation. Uh, in fact, that was even apparent during Thomas Jefferson's time. He, he wrote while president, Our rapid multiplication will expand beyond these limits and cover the whole continent with a people speaking the same language, governed in similar forms and by similar laws. So the idea is that the United States is going to go from coast to coast, from the Atlantic Ocean westward to the Pacific. Uh, the idea of manifest destiny. Well, destiny has to deal with an idea that we don't have a choice. Uh, it's something that's thrown upon us by a higher power, God, uh, you know, spirituality, or just, you know, fate. It, it's going to happen. Nothing can stop it. Uh, so it's this almost religious belief that a lot of people in the United States have that it's been determined by God that the United States will go from sea to shining sea, that it's, it's our job, uh, it's our mission, our duty to spread civilization uh, into the West and, and to go into all this land. You have to remember the Native American populations out West in the 1820s and the 1830s, they only numbered about a million people. So the Native Americans are outnumbered significantly. I mean, that's that just in a sheer numbers game. Well, let's take a look at this painting here. Um, this painting you're going to see in every uh, middle school, high school, and college textbook. To actually to get a sense of what it's about, um, we need to understand that it was actually painted in 1872 uh, by a guy named John Gast. And what we're going to see right here in the middle of uh, this painting is the, the Lady Columbia and this, you know, white kind of pretty lady. I don't know if she's pretty, but uh, she's got the star there on her head. She's carrying a school book. She's stringing the telegraph wires in her hands. Uh, of course, the telegraphs are following the trains and the railroads. And over here we have what kind of looks like New York City. I don't know if Brooklyn Bridge was completed there by 1872. I kind of think it wasn't. Uh, but it's a foregone conclusion. I mean, this is, you know, civilization, and it's, you know, spreading across the map. We've got the Native Americans in the distance, the wild horses there, a wagon train, and then more pioneers heading across. The Native Americans scurrying off there, and in the back, the buffalo are fleeing as well. So all the Native Americans, all their, everything about their way of life and their culture is being uh, pushed back by all this civilization, whether we're talking about you know, guys that kind of look like prospectors there, and we have the farmers over here with their plows or, uh, and the animals there, all this you know, natural beauty of the land. Uh, and the idea of the people in the 1800s, the idea was that they had to, to take the land, to tame it, to bend it to their will, to, to get it to do uh, their bidding. Uh, and the Native Americans were really just in the way. Uh, so we're going to see Manifest Destiny uh, used quite a bit. It sort of becomes a part of the American conscience. Uh, not everybody's for it. There's a lot of people that are against it. In fact, uh, Abraham Lincoln is never a real big supporter of uh, how we go about Manifest Destiny. Uh, we're going to make a lot of judgments and we're going to make a lot of calls that aren't, aren't going to seem very moral. Uh, so that's kind of the nature of, nature of this.